My name is Monk Rowe for the Phillies Jazz Archive, and I'm very pleased to have Virginia Mayhew with me, saxophonist and composer, and uh, I hear you do karate as well. I do. I've been doing karate a long time. Yeah. It's uh, It's been life-changing, actually. I've been doing it since I first moved to New York, so that's over 30 years. When we were um, trying to decide a time to meet, I recall that I, maybe the first time I suggested happened to be in the morning. And you said, well, I could, but I like to practice. And I had two reactions. First of all, good for you. And second of all, like, I should do that more myself. Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a working musician. So, I mean, I, I have to practice. And I just find that the early part of the day, I'm more focused. I have more energy. And then I'm not thinking about, oh my God, I got to practice all day long. So I just, I practice. And then on a, on a good day, I'll get in there and I'll, I'll do some more stuff or arranging or whatever. But uh, the morning, early part of the day up till maybe two o'clock is the best time for me. Can you tell me if, if your practice now is considerably different than it might've been 15 or 20 years ago? My personal practicing? Yes. On the section. 15 or 20 years ago. I would say generally it's not that much different. I, I, I do some, you know, stuff to get my air and my sound going and I do some technical stuff and, and then I work on music. So it's same general. I mean, I'm the, what I work on might be different depending on, you know, what I have coming up, but, uh, right. Yeah. So why I would you, to... why do you think that? Well, I'm a, when I, I am motivated to practice, it usually for me is something like you just mentioned, what's coming up? Like I have to get <laughs> beyond motivated, I might, might be panicky. <laughs> I so, try to avoid panicky, but uh, it does happen. <laughs> yes. Um, and do you also practice your karate at home? I do. I have not been uh, practicing as much karate as I would like for the last few years, especially. I've been taking care of my folks, mm -hmm. uh, and that was all encompassing. Yes. And um, ever since I moved out to Jersey from the city, it's been, I used to practice karate all the time, and it's been harder since I've been out here, but uh, I've done better. I'm, I'm just getting back to it now before my folks died, unfortunately. So, getting back to my life. Uh, and that's a big part of it. Okay. Um, I'd like to read a paragraph here and uh, perhaps you have a comment or reaction to it. This is from Steve Futterman who wrote for Nightlife. In the New Yorker. Yes. I was so happy. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it says, with few guarantees of either recognition or fortune, the life of a serious jazz instrumentalist is a saga of fortitude. Virginia Mayhew, a post-bop saxophonist and composer of obvious depth and feeling, has bobbed and weaved through the musical trenches for four decades now, accruing respect from her peers and offering pleasure to those who've become acquainted with her artistry. And then it goes on to say your upcoming gig at Smalls, uh, which helps keep the heart of mainstream jazz beating, much like Mayhew herself. Wow. You know, I sent him uh, a message immediately because for two reasons. First of all, he totally gets it. And second of all, because all the years that I've been here, I've never gotten mentioned in The New Yorker. And it's like, it's not really a big deal, obviously, but I was so happy. And I have a friend who's 94 and she gets a New Yorker, and, you know, she's always reading it. And finally, she saw my, my name there with a good little blurb. So it was a wonderful uh, on so many levels. I hope you cut it out because I would have. Well, I, I, I have it on my computer. Uh, yeah. okay. Maybe I'll print it up so I have a backup copy. Yes. Um, but that was just, I was so happy to get that. I've had a few things like that happen in the last year or so. It just, ah, just when you need it, a little, you know, somebody gets it. And it, it really, it really, the timing has been good. I'd like to focus on 
two terms he used, mainstream and post-bop. He, he called you a post-bop saxophonist, which I don't think you'd necessarily argue with, with as far as a timeline. But do, do you describe your playing with terms like that? If, if you could write a review of yourself, what terms would you use to describe your playing? Well, I had a friend doing my website and PR stuff for many years, Deb Lake, and she came up with a little blurb to go with uh, with me and with my label, Renma Recordings, and it's and she said uh, jazz with a twist. So it's it's pretty straight ahead, but. It's not, you know, we're not playing standards all the time and we're not playing, you know, other people's arrangements. And I've, I think with mainstream, I mean, mainstream has changed as I'm sure you know. So it's a little bit of a tricky thing. But when I think of mainstream, I think of not really what's happening now in jazz with all the, the young people. And I'd love to talk to you about all that uh, also, but I mean, I'm not a free player, uh, but I'm not totally mainstream, but I have elements of mainstream. So that's what I really like when she said jazz with a twist. It's like we play songs, whether they're originals or whatever, uh, with melodies and, and um, it's just, but then we do things like some odd meters, and um, the last chunk of years, I've been playing a lot more with my old friend, Roberta Pickett. Do you know her? I saw that in, one of the Incredible, videos. incredible pianist and musician. And she uses all these weird chords. And so I did a recording project with her a few years ago, uh, the music of Mary, Mary, uh, Mary and McPartland. I, did you hear that? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Mary, the, Mary Lou Williams or Mary? No, Williams? Mary, she did, I did Mary Lou. She did yeah. uh, Mary and McPartland. I see. And so she writes all these weird chords. So I was just writing a tune uh, this week and I'm starting to hear those, really hear those weird chords. So I'm always trying to grow, you know, with the harmony and the, and the rhythm, you know, odd meters and, and everything. Um, do you, so, yeah. Do you have um, perfect pitch? I do not. Nor do I. And when I, and playing with a, a, a pianist, especially who who uses what I will use your term also, sort of weird chords. Um, do you have a way of finding your way in them? Um, well, it depends if I have a chance to work on the stuff, which I did with Roberta's music. So I would sit at the piano and I would play those chords and I would see what do I hear over that? And I had to do it chord by chord because there are so many of them. Uh, but I'm starting to hear them now. And if I if I don't have that, like recently I did a rehearsal with Billy Mintz. Do you know him, a great drummer? And he has this tune. It's really hard. The Anyhow, it's just a really hard tune. And he said, don't look at the chord changes. Don't think about the chord changes. Just play. And if I don't know what's going on with the harmony on that kind of stuff, I just play you know, and try to make melodies and, and create something. Because you can't, you can't, unless they're playing one of those chords for a long time, you can't really catch it. I mean, what's your experience with that? Well, I, I find that I probably <laughs> avoid the situations. <laughs> I, I like to put myself in yeah. challenging situations. That's I think good. that might come from my karate training it's just maybe not i don't know i maybe not but i like to put i like to be challenged not that i'm not challenged by anything but i like to really throw myself into the deep end and fortunately i have friends and peers that like to do that so i have a, a brief anecdote um i got to know marion mcpartland many years ago and when she came to utica to perform i got to interview her before the concert. And she said something like, well, do you have uh, any requests for the concert tonight? And, and I, I don't know why I said this, but I said, well, what about playing something free? So she did. 
And then the uh, other day I was listening to you as her guest and you played something free. Did we? You did. And so I wondered how that felt. Do you remember it? I have no memory of that at all. Uh, I hadn't done very much free playing at that point or still. And uh, what I do remember is the mouth on her. <laughs> did you experience that? Yes. I mean, you hear, you know, and she's all proper and everything, but in the studio when we recorded that, I could not believe the things coming out of her mouth. It was so great. And then she'd get back on the mic all proper and everything. It was so funny. She I don't did. remember that. I need to, I need to dig that up. She listened to it. Yeah. Because, and, and it's funny because at, at the end of it, she said something like, well, you really can't go wrong with this. <laughs> with playing free? Yes. And, well, and it was, it's, it's interesting because sometimes I could, I was putting myself in your place and I could hear you sort of trying to find out where is she, or maybe I won't even try to find out. I have but, no memory at all, yeah. but I do know that I certainly wasn't comfortable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, it begs a question uh, and I, I oftentimes ask this one and the question is, are there wrong notes in improvising for you? I think it's a matter of the music that you're playing and your intent, because you can hit, I mean, if you're playing something that's really inside it, to me, it sounds sort of weird unless you're playing, like maybe you're playing some sort of idea that you're in and then you take it out and then you come back in. But if you just play one note that's really sticking out there and then you don't, like, I don't know if you've ever done this, you play something that's, well, I'm not sure about that. And then instead of just running, you, you try to incorporate that, like play it some more times or develop it into something different. Um, but the better, the older and better I get, I realize, like Monk said, there aren't really any wrong notes, depending, for me, adding, depending on the intent. Okay. You know, if you really want to hear that major third over a, a minor triad, I mean, I really like the way it sounds if you go from the minor to the major and, and back to the minor, it creates it creates dissonance. But if you're playing in a minor blue and you blues and you keep playing the major third, like just in your lines and stuff, that would bother me. Uh, I agree. It, it, um, you usually can sort of tell if people are doing it on purpose mm -hmm. rather than they don't know that it's sort of not working <laughs> or else if they grimace then you know that they know <laughs> and they just laid a wrong note <laughs> yes well um i'd like to try i'd act i've never actually asked this question specifically of anybody so i'm going to try it out on you and <laughs> let's suppose there's a little, a little scenario and uh, we meet at a cocktail party and i'm like an investment banker and I ask you, well, Virginia, what do you do for a living? And you say, well, I'm a jazz musician. And, and I say, well, how do you play jazz? How do you play jazz? How do you play jazz? Let's get another drink. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's to, to play, to do anything well takes years and years. I mean, how do you play jazz? I guess you. You mean the process or well, what to say to this guy? That's I, my I, question. It's, it's a ridiculous question. It's up broad. Yes, it's way too broad. All right. So he, he continues to say, well, I kind of like jazz. I've heard except when they do that thing where they're just, I guess they're just making it up. How does that work? I don't get it. I, I guess I would ask him, you know, are you talking about after the melody? In general, it happens all the time. Or are you talking about a kind of music that what we call free music, where it's there isn't really any set plan? And I guess depending on if, if he could answer that question, I would 
go yeah, in a direction. Well, yes, I heard I heard a group playing uh, My Funny Valentine, and I liked it. And then it started. Uh, then I didn't know how do they know when to stop, and the other person plays. And I don't, yes, I don't I've think been that. asked that before. Of course, it's and so I would explain that there's a, a form to the to the song. It's a, a certain number of certain amount of time you do this, and then there's another a certain amount of time you do this. And everybody knows, and there are different things that happen during that. I mean, how, you know, I don't think I would even say chords, you know, it sounds like he would be pretty clueless. Different things happen, but everything happens in a set time. Um, so that's going on all during the song. And if you sing the melody of the song while that's happening, you should be able to tell, you know, you should come out the same place that they do when they come back and play the melody again. All right. I mean, it's a, I've been asked that question and it's really just a matter of how long do you want to talk to this person about it? Yes. And then you think, yes, I think I will go get another drink. <laughs> no, I mean, if they really seem like they're interested, then it'll go on longer. Yes. Right. I mean, I always try to answer, I always try to be nice and answer people's questions as best I can. Sure. And some things aren't, uh, I think some things aren't necessarily answerable. Uh, with improvisation, for, for for me, there's a bit of magic to it that is not explainable, and I'm I, I don't mind that. Definitely, there's magic when it's happening. Let me take you back a little bit. Um, I understand you're you come from a musical family, and your grandparents were classical musicians, and they supported. Am I correct that they supported your your career, even though they didn't understand it? Yes. My grandfather said to me once, you know, I worry about you playing this jazz music, you know, there are drugs and alcohol and, and, you know, why don't you get a job like in a symphony or something? And I told him that this is the music I really love. And they were both very broad minded. And the fact that it was music even though they didn't get it it was music and and i was obviously serious whenever i was there i would be practicing a lot it was a great place to practice and um so they knew i was serious and and they respected that enough to say okay we want to support this i think the term get it is very interesting because I could respect what they're doing, but if they're playing a piece by Schoenberg or something, I'm going to say, I don't get it. Yep. Yep. So Definitely. You don't necessarily have to enjoy something, quote, to get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think if you, once you get it, you're going to enjoy it a lot more. Speaking of getting it, um, I, I see on your, your, your quote, resume, that uh, when you were still on the West Coast, you did some work with, um, with Frank Zappa. Is that, cor is that correct? Yes. The uh, Berkeley, California Symphony commissioned him. This is a great story. They commissioned him to write a symphony or whatever. And my opinion, he listened to, you know, all the modern cats, and then he brought in this Actually, I was playing saxophone with it and I had never, excuse me, played with a symphony orchestra. So I got the music ahead and I'm practicing and it's like all this multi polyrhythmic stuff. Like it would be a, a, in three, four, it would be a four over three. And then within that, there would be some triplets and things were tied and some of it was not really in the, ideal range and it was really 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 hard and um i worked my tail off on it and the my feeling I, I shouldn't say this i'm gonna get myself in trouble again was i just felt like he listened to a bunch of this modern music and somehow stuck it all together and and i i had no emotional it just felt like sort of like he was just trying to impress somebody but the good part the best part of the story is at our dress rehearsal, my uh, my roommate's parents came. They're from Missouri. And so we start rehearsing. And all of a sudden, out onto stage, 
come these huge, like maybe eight or 10 foot long high penises. Boop, 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 boop. And it turned out this was basically a pornographic puppet show. <laughs> so my friend's mother grabbed the father and took him out of there right away. But <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> Oh, uh, you are correct. It makes for a great story. <laughs> Gee, I wonder how soon they booked Frank back. <laughs> oh, they lost their shirt on that because that was a great or a great symphony orchestra. Yeah, but they played a little bit brave, but mostly fairly straight ahead. And this just was they lost their base. I see. It's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, I saw him in 1968, I think. And I. Wow. I just, he it was with the Mothers of Invention and mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure I was impressed at the same time confused. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't get it as we were saying, um, but I know there must be something there because I have friends that think he's really great. Uh, do you know Ed Palermo? I do not. He's a saxophone player, composer, arranger. He has a band. He's been doing Frank, Frank Zappa music for decades. Uh -huh. And he's a really good musician. So I know that there's something there that I'm missing, but I don't know what it is. When you sit down um, after you've practiced your saxophone and you're, do you have to be in a mood to compose? Definitely. And what kind of mood is that? I mean, it depends. Just, I just, what usually what happens is I start hearing something. And so then I go and, and figure it, figure it out. Do um, you go to the piano or do you yeah. pick up your saxophone? Uh, well, if I'm practicing or something, then I'll mess around with it for a while, but then I'll go to the piano and, and try to figure out, you know, try to write down what I'm hearing. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, there's something different when I'm writing. It's, there's a, a different feeling. There's a reason that I go to write. Uh, I, I'm not just like a professional composer who sits down every morning and starts writing, whether it's good or bad. I read something about your compositional reaction to 9-11. I don't know that I had one. Oh, I did. Yeah, my Phantoms album. Yes. That was um, such, so heavy. It's it's an interesting concept to uh, try to capture an event or a really incredibly strong emotion in in music. Well, I agree with that. Um, it was really just one tune, and it was a tune by Kenny Barron called phantoms and i just i just felt like i think if we play this rubato and ingrid jensen and i were playing a lot together then and we just play this rubato and it just i didn't i didn't say anything to them about it but i i just that's sort of what i was going for was phantoms like like what happened that day and mm -hmm. i didn't write a whole project about it and i didn't really set out to do it it was just just came to me. <laughs> Did you have a number of, I can remember specific recordings when I was younger that I didn't know the, um, the term epiphany yet, but they gave me one. Yes. And did you have a similar experience? I did several. Um, the first one, I would say would be when I heard uh, one of Dex when I heard Dexter Gordon because he was so melodic and he was so swinging uh, and that's what I responded to and then um, the next time I still remembered I was playing along with this it was when I was an alto player a lead alto player and I was playing along with a Count Basie record and I don't know I think it was Willie Smith the lead alto hit a high B flat just the one on top of the staff. And I finally got the 
the alto sound I'd been trying to get from that one note, just hearing that one note. I kept playing it over and over the recording and just because he had it ring, it was, it was exactly the sound I was trying to get. And, and that was, that was amazing. And then some Coltrane things that I heard were pretty amazing. And so many things in jazz. I mean, it's, it's constant. Well, not constant, but yeah. Well, my one note, was was Cannonball Adderley when he went when he played Mercy 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 and he went ba ba da 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 and I yeah said, oh oh I have to play like that that one note isn't that amazing how that can just like yes that's exactly the same experience I had yeah it just Ooh. resonates I guess yes indeed do you try to um, assume you've done some teaching over the years and how do you how do you pass that magic on is there a way you can sort of jump start that passion in students well that is my main goal when i'm teaching is to ignite the passion and because once you have the passion you'll do the work and so I have my students always start having fun in the first lesson. And then we develop it and, you know, depends if it's like a camp, that's one thing or private lessons, but I always start them off doing things that are fun right away and playing recordings for them so they can hear something besides their lousy school band and playing you know maybe playing with them but i i try to get them have them get the bug that's my goal yeah that's that's really important because if if the school band is what they think of as the as the norm or this is what music is supposed to sound like how are they supposed to go beyond that well they know they like it because they're either taking lessons or at camp or whatever. So that they've got to start on it. So I try to try to get them to in, in expand on that and you know learn about improvising and just expose them to different different music and 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 but always the technical stuff as well and the theory. But the bug is the, the first thing. Have you had circumstances with students? or and or their parents where they ask you about uh, your opinion should i go into a career in jazz or this is what i'm thinking about do you think i should i usually give the answer that i heard somewhere along the way which is if you don't have to like emotionally if you don't have to do it don't because you're never going to you're never going to hang in there if it's not something that you feel like this is what I want to do I ha this is what I'm going to do if you don't have that kind of attitude you're going to quit I think so I mean it depends what age you're talking about I, I and if they're getting you know like high school or whatever then uh, usually the people that ask that are pretty serious. So I, I, I've, like I had a student, the guy who brought me up to Fredonia uh, a few weeks ago, he had been a student right before the pandemic. And he was just this amazing kid and he worked so hard and, and he, he was going to be a professional musician and I knew he'd be great because he was so passionate. He was playing bassoon. He was writing arrangements already in high school and practicing. But that's my, that's my stock answer. If you don't have to do it mm -hmm. for your soul, don't do it. But if you do, do it. It's amazing life. Well, you, I think you answered my next question. <laughs> and that was, was there ever a point where things uh, were harder than usual for a length of time and you considered another profession? No. 
never. But right now, I'm not considering another profession, but I'm trying to figure out where I fit in, the, in today, because jazz, the jazz of the people that are 40 or 40, 40 ish, or maybe even, I don't know, 50 ish, whenever the jazz schools really got going, the music that they're creating and they are fast becoming the majority, if not already, uh, it doesn't have two of the things that I fell in love with jazz, the, the swing and the blues are pretty much missing. And I'm just trying to figure out where I'm not going to change who I am or what I do. I'm always trying to grow, but I see, well, I'm not sure where I'm going to fit in, in with what, where it's going now. It, you're, um, it's almost like you're reading my, my thoughts here because I've been listening as, not as much as I should, but I think what I'm confused about is the time you know, there's a way to play the time and there's a way to play around with the time mm -hmm. and the, many of the things i hear it's like everybody in the rhythm section is playing around with the time mm -hmm. so where exactly is it mm -hmm. uh, I, and i guess i'm a old-fashioned groove guy i need i need <laughs> i don't want to think too hard to hear it well, it's definitely a different thing. And uh, I'm basically, I'm, I'm with you, but I also love that, but not as a place to live. I like to visit there. And, and the better I've gotten at it, the more fun it is. But I, I, I think it's really, it depends on what music you're playing. I mean, if you're, no, that's not true. I don't know. I'm okay with it being more, less rigid. I'm okay with that. Uh, I love that too, but I know, I think I know what you're talking about and it's a little, a little es too esoteric for you maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I know that um, the, the musicians um, that I've interviewed that were playing in, in the 40s and 50s, they often would say, well, today's generation, they all sound uh, the same. They get the books and they learn the licks and then they sound the same. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that's really what's happening today. And there are some great musicians uh, but I just don't relate to it. And everybody below the great people, they all sound the same. They go to school and they all learn the same thing and they, and they all have, I mean, this is a gross generalization, but it seems like in general, they have incredible technique, uh, but they don't, like I said at the beginning, they don't have swing and they don't have any blues in their playing. And it's all sort of what you're talking about, sort of a little bit, it's open and I like it. I like it when it's open, but not all the time. Okay. What, what do you think? I believe... It's an interesting question because I think about it. Question, but... And I think it has to do partly with, with jazz as it should be, has been anointed as an art form now, and certainly it should be, and it's embraced by academia. Um, but the thing that happened in smoky nightclubs... Um, they have no experience of that. Right. And I, I'm going to jump to this because I watched a couple videos of you, and you... Let me, I'll, I'll get this together. Uh, when you were talking to Marion McPartland, you were talking about different gigs and it's a little club where people aren't really listening. You had addressed some question of hers. And then I watched this thing and you were you were playing body and soul in this club. 
and it was so noisy. I think, was that when George Garzon was, sat in? That's when the, George was there. And I thought it was so interesting because this is reality, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, that was reality sometimes. And then you'd be playing at the Kennedy Center the next night. Isn't that it's amazing. And that's, that was a particularly, I wouldn't have kept that except that Garzon was playing. I see. You know, it was, that was especially bad, but that place, the garage, sometimes it got, it got like that. Mm -hmm. So I rarely played a ballad there, but for Jack, for, for Garzon. Yeah, that was an extreme situation, that one. <laughs> but absolutely people talking and drinking and it's, you know, it, it, it just depends on the setting. It, it, if it's, if it's a bar, it's a bar. That's what it is. If it's a concert hall, nobody better be talking. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of the clubs like Bradley's and and uh, Mesro. Have you been there? No. It's a, it's it's run by um, Spike Wilner, the same guy that has Smalls, and it's a little room. Did you ever go to Bradley's? No. Oh, you missed out. Bradley's was an amazing little club. It was very small, and that's what the, this place Mesro is like. And they have a no talking policy. So it's it really depends on the gig. If you're not supposed to talk. It bothers me if you're talking, but if it's if it's a gig like that in a bar or something, I mean that's what happens. It's that's the gig. Don't take the gig if you can't, you know, can't deal with that. And you play for me. I play different music if I'm playing in a situation like that. I mean, I might play some of the same music, but you have to play. I'll play my music, but it's for the audience. I mean, even if they're not listening and they're talking and yelling, something that they will re relate to. I don't know. I don't want to sound like. I gear my music to the audience, but I have a wide range of within what I, I of me. Sure. And so I, I've done so many of those kinds of gigs over the years. I think that that's really helped form who I am as opposed to somebody who hasn't had that experience, mm -hmm. you know, blowing gigs. That's part of being a band leader too, um, is recognizing the situation you're in and making the, the best possible uh, presentation you can in that surrounding, I guess. Mm -hmm. Are you a band leader also? I have been, yes. And um, I was wondering if there are things, I don't know if angry is the right word. Are there things on the bandstand that can aggravate you from? From the musicians? Honest? Yes, from musicians. Yes. Uh, well, obviously anything musical, like they're not listening or they're playing BS, you know, but I've, I've been really lucky. I, I, that hardly ever happens to me. I had this gig at the garage in the village for many years. And I, I sometimes I'd have to get somebody at the last minute. And it, it's just amazing the great people I could get. Really top shelf people. Everybody just wanted to play. So, oh wait, but I lost track of your question. No, you're you you're answering it that um, because you were able to draw from such a large pool of excellent musicians that you probably didn't have those situations very much. But now, since phones and and if when if a person pulls out their phone, I'm thinking of one particular person that I hire that has done that. That really bothers me. Do not be checking your messages during the bass solo. You know what I mean? Yes, I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> um, uh, what are we talking about? We're talk. Let, let's talk about um, Diva for for a minute. Um, I know Sherry, and it's been a quite an amazing project. Twenty five. Let me see. It's over thirty years, I think, by now. It's been a really. Uh, a really important band. I think it brought a number of people in from other countries that were able to get visas because of it. And it's given um, a lot of women um, experience that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise and created a lot of really long-term friendships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people have come through that band. You made a comment uh, I, in an article that even though 
you were told that uh, no, play the clarinet instead. Girls don't play the saxophone. Right. That it's better now. Yes, absolutely. What's the main reason f you think that there's been such resistance going back decades for women to play certain instruments? The reason? Yeah. Well, I mean, sexism, basically. Yes. And, you know, societal norms of what women can and can't do. Apparently, during World War II, a lot, when all the guys went over to fight, women stepped up and did all those gigs. And then, I don't know where they came from. They must have already existed. They didn't start from scratch. But then when they came back, every all the work stopped again. So I think it's a cultural thing. And also with wanting to have a family and are you, are you talking about elementary school no no i'm talking about the professional world yeah um wanting to have a family doesn't it's it's a lot better now people are, seem to be able to pull it off more but it's mm -hmm. really hard to, to live that kind of a lifestyle if you want to have a family with kids and especially yeah. when you're young um my friend ingrid jensen who's very successful she didn't have her child until she was in her forties and already well established. I just can't imagine how anybody could have a child early unless you have like somebody that's in a stay home and take care of the kid mm -hmm. uh, and have a career when you need to be out in your formative years and stuff like that. Did I get off topic there? Oh, no, you did not. I wonder if you had been offered before you came a tenor player, if you've been offered to play one of the alto chairs in the Count Basie Orchestra, would you have taken the gig? Absolutely. Absolutely, because I was a lead alto player at that time. And I would have loved that. That would have been a blast. <laughs> yeah, I've dreamt of it myself. Yeah, are you mostly an alto player? Yes. What about, great, great, uh, and great. I also saw uh, Junior Mance and, mm -hmm. and Joe Williams on your on your list. You couldn't play with anybody good, eh? No, I was so lucky when I first moved to New York. I went to the new school and the faculty was like a who's who of living jazz giants. It, and it was amazing. And and that's where I met Norman. And uh, Norman introduced me to Al and to Clark Terry. And that's where I met Junior. And then it turned out that Junior was a secondary degree black belt at the place I had just started taking karate. I did not know that. And those were the days when it was hard to get to black belt. I mean, not that it's not hard now, but it was very physical, very hardcore, more hardcore than it is, is now on a fighting level. And, and yeah, so that was great. And he was such a nice guy and uh, obviously a great musician. I was so lucky. I met so many great people there got to play with him mm -hmm. and then norman introduced me to al he put me on a recording session of i don't know if it was al or somebody else and they just brought me in to just play the saxophone parts and then they were going to just you know bring in whoever to overdub the solos and stuff and then they decided that i did a such a good job quote unquote that they left me on the recording and that was when al started hiring me nice so i was things were really popping at that point it was I really was so lucky and Joe Williams what a nice guy what changed uh in the New York scene from the time you arrived uh, like in the next 15 or 20 years well the New York scene I mean there are a lot of different scenes so, you know, there's the free scene. If, and if you're just talking about jazz, okay, but then there are all the other things like salsa and everything. But in jazz, there's the free scene. Uh, and I played with this group called the 12 Tone Funk Orchestra when I first got there. It was so much fun. And, but the straight ahead, you know, the, the predominant jazz scene was a, basically a bebop scene. And that was when Wynton Marcellus and uh, all the young lions came out and it was sort of like, when he came out, it was sort of the people at the new school, uh, 
teachers and stuff re refer to him sort of like, you know, the jazz police. It was like, it's, this is the way, you know, this is it. And they all wore suits. And it was a very, uh, he took what was sort of, I mean, everybody did play bebop, but he took what was like more, a more open thing and made it, I thought, I felt, and they felt, you know, much more rigid into the parameters. Um, and, but bebop was king for sure when I moved to New York and uh, everybody played bebop and everybody that I, the people that I knew, the masters that I knew, and they had, they had their own things, but it was definitely bebop. And I started, I did an interview in the late nineties. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, darn it. I'll try Bruce, Indiana, Bruce. Anyhow, and I said something that I thought I would regret later, and I probably will, but I'm going to say it again now. And I, and, uh, I said, it seems to be, I said, there's this thing happening in 1998. So that was a little over 10 years after I moved there. Uh, I call it Brooklyn White Boy Jazz. And it's, and it's exactly what it has become. You know, the end of the swing and blues and digging in and uh that's what i that would be i know i'm i'm a nasty person but that that is the biggest change is like the standard when i moved here in 87 was bebop was the standard and now most of those people now the people playing at the village vanguard are i mean i would hesitate to say that to certain people, but that, that's really the school they're in. They're in this sort of Brooklyn white boy jazz school, which is now the main, uh, it's, it, to me, it's like it's esoteric uh, and it's a lot, a lot of technique at all times and it doesn't have any blues in it. And not to say that they're not great musicians. It's just, I don't feel anything other than, wow, that's amazing that he can do that. Hmm. Uh, I, I think the key word that you words you just said there was was at all times. Yeah, lots of, lots of technique at all times. Yeah, <laughs> right. But why why Brooklyn? I I don't know. I don't well, have a New York vibe. I don't know too much about it. But oh, why okay. Brooklyn? Well, um, already by the time I moved to New York, most musicians had moved out to Brooklyn because of the rents, not most, but many. And so that's where the, the young musicians in particular lived in Brooklyn. And so that's, okay. that was sort of where the scene was. If we, I hope you don't mind me pursuing this because I, no, no. I like what you have to say about it. Um, I think it's important if you call it Brooklyn white boy jazz. Oh man. Yeah. We, what is, um, why is it white? Well, when I came up now, this has changed also because now it's not just white people that play like that. When I came up, people that I like to listen to were basically black and they had their roots in rhythm they cared about the rhythm and they, and the blues was a part of it. You know, the swing was a part of it. The blues was a part of it. And this shift was almost completely white. And there, now there are, you know, there are some other people uh, of color, but the basic push in that direction was usually uh, white male uh, college graduates. And so that's why I called it that. that. Okay. So politically incorrect. No, but I've been I've been uh, over the years adjudicated at many high school jazz festivals, and there's hardly any students of color in in these things. Now that could be the suburban schools, but it's not just that I don't think. And uh, I see it at the college level. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the sociologists have opinions on it, but 
I'm not sure why. What is it about this music that has less appeal? Well, if you look at, say, even 30 years ago, I was in my mid twenties. So my mom, I, so my mom, when she was growing up, well, my mom was white, but, but that would have been the music of the time, the popular music that people of the parents of people of my generation grew up with people still really liked jazz, you know, and the, and the fans, the hardcore fans that really knew everything they were alive and they played the stuff for their kids and people grew up with it. But now the parents grew up in a world where it's not really in general as important, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And so then you've got, let's see if there's a parent, if you got a, a 20 year old and their parents were 20 when they had them. So that would have been the eighties, late seventies that these people were born and they they just don't have the history of it being as important especially i think the internet has had a big influence on it also the internet yes because i don't know it just seems like people used to in my generation people would play records and 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 everything is just really uh family life it just seems like with all the channels on Netflix and everything, and just to sit around the house and have music, it, it's time, it just seems like the whole society has changed. And so that comes down on the, the, the parents of the kids that are going to college. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know who wants or doesn't want their kid to become a jazz musician, but at these days, I just spoke to somebody last week who was going to the new school and he said it's forty thousand dollars a year yes and that is much less than many places i mean cost of course the cost of living on top of that in new york city but many of the top universities are twenty thousand dollars more than that how can anybody afford that i mean other than yeah. It's crazy. And <laughs> sometimes you you wonder what all the jazz graduates are going to do. Come to New York. Come to <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> well, now everybody's moving to Queens now. Brooklyn has been out is, has outpriced everybody. I see. Well, so Queens the new the new place. I see. I'll probably see that an article about that in the Sunday New York Times pretty 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 soon in the uh magazine section about the arts moving to Queens. Yes. <laughs> Probably you will. Oh, I've I mean, enjoyed this it's... a lot. Uh, who's uh, what's a short list of your musical heroes? Short list? Yeah. Well, I mean, Sonny Rollins, Coltrane, uh, Dexter Gordon, uh, Joe Henderson, Lester Young, uh, Kenny Garrett, Cannonball Bird, uh, and then Ingrid Jensen, Roberta Pickett, Victor Jones. I mean, I get to play with all these people and they're such great musicians and they continue to grow. And I just, I, I think they're inspiring. You know, it's, and, and the, the music moves on and Coltrane's been dead how many decades? And, you know, George Garzon, I love George Garzon. Do you know him? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And saxophone players. And it just, it's, I mean, I have my people that I grew up loving. And at this point, I mean, I still love them, of course, but I, I just really love the people today, of the people today that are creative within what I determine in my little world of jazz mm -hmm. that I like. Uh, let me try a name this tune on you. Oh, goodness. I'm so bad at remembering the name of tunes. Are you okay. going to play well, something I'm, for me? I'm so bad at uh, trying to vocalize it. So we're okay. Let me just get my. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
supposed to be in five. Oh, okay. Did you got it? One, two, three, four, five. Bop, ba de, ba da de, a da do, bop. Oh, yeah, Monterey Blues. Uh, you got it. Yay, you can move <laughs> on to the next round. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sure do your homework for these well, things. Well, I, I, I love that tune, and it's a great way to play something in five that still feels good. It's still cheerful. <laughs> it's still cheerful. Yeah, I agree. I agree that that's, they don't play anything in five like that these days. Mm. I'm so old. I mean, I feel like just like what happened 20 years ago, you know, there were a lot of people that felt anyhow, whatever. Well, for, for the people who watch this, I should mention that that's a, a composition of yours. Yes. Right. Monterey and, blues. Yeah. And it's interesting that we're, we've been talking about the blues and I just love the fact that the blues form is so adaptable. Mm -hmm. You can just never stop using it. You can mm -hmm. put anything to it. Yep. Mess with it. Another, uh, you know, monk tunes are also really good for that. Monk tunes, because they're so strong. Yeah. The melodies or the rhythmic, the rhythms, you know, the hits and stuff, they work really well with odd meters or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's a, uh, not a softball question to uh, sort of wrap up to. I'm I'm interested in what artists have to think about the state of our country. So you could pass on the question, but if you want to offer sure. something, I'd be happy to hear about it. Sure. I think we're in a very dark and dangerous point in our history uh, right now with the anti-democratic uh, not just direction, but I, I feel like we might even have a civil civil war um, because it's it just seems like what's been happening with the Republican Party and the fact that they still embrace Trump after everything uh, it's just like they are you a Republican? No. I hope not. Uh, um, they just, it's like they, they don't think and they're so angry and their morals, they have no morals. They'll do whatever it takes to get what they want. They'll cheat, they'll lie, they'll, they'll steal. Uh, and it was really um, an eye opener for me when Trump got elected because I had no idea that there were that many people that would vote for somebody like that. I mean, I knew they existed, but I had no idea of the number and what's happening with race. I mean, it, it's hard to, I, I guess that's a plus of the internet age and everybody having a camera on their phone. Maybe we're just finding out more about this stuff. I mean, I knew that there were issues, but I had no idea that there's as much uh, racism and hatred mm -hmm. in this country. I mean, I knew there was, but not to the degree that it is. And then, the, of course, the whole thing with Russia, I mean, Putin could set off a nuclear bomb at any time. And then there's China. And I, I, I think that that all contributes to me just wanting to do what I want to do, play the music I want to play with the great musicians I get to play with. And what do you think? Yes, it makes it that all that much more valuable. And I, I'm, uh, I, I've felt like I've been an optimist most of my life, but it's harder and harder to be one now. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with everything you've you've said. And it seems like technology has brought out the worst in many people. The best in some, but the worst in in a lot of people. And it's like, it's yeah. okay to share all of it and try to convince others to be that way. Mm -hmm. As I can. I can. I can. I and you can find a little group of people, like-minded people, no matter what you're into, you can find those people on the internet. Whereas before the internet, it, you, you wouldn't find all these mm -hmm. 
hundreds or thousands of people that think like you, so you would keep it down. <laughs> I don't know. I think we're in trouble. Yeah. Well, let's uh, uh, think happy thoughts, like a major third against a minor blues. <laughs> uh, Ouch. Only oh. temporarily. <laughs> oh. Try it, try it. Play, play like a little line, hit the minor third and then go up to the major third for a minute and then go back down. Okay. I'm going to do Takes it. a little getting used to it, but it's really a cool sound. <laughs> hey, I, this has been so nice and I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope I get to meet you in person one of these days. That would be really nice. Thank you. And I enjoyed it myself. Good. All mm. right. Thank I you. Guess very, I... Thank you very much, Virginia. I'm going to, I'm going to sign out and then we'll say our goodbyes. Okay, so I should stay here then? I just hang out okay. for a bit. <laughs>